All right. Good morning. It's good to uh, it's good to be back this morning. We were uh, I was traveling last week. We were uh, preaching in the uh, Quad Cities area, uh, helping out a church there. And uh, but I tell you what, it's good to be home. This is home for us, and uh, it's good to be back. Uh, with you guys this morning, and thanks for those who are watching online this morning as well. Uh, this morning, we are beginning a brand new series called Remarkable, Remarkable, and uh, we're in the season right now, uh, the church uh, as a whole, uh, this is usually the season uh, of Lent, uh, Ash Wednesday, believe it or not, began on the 17th, and that takes us through April 3rd, uh, uh, Easter on, is on April 4th uh, this year, and so this is a season where normally uh, believers around the world, they reflect uh, on what Christ has done for us, and so we reflect on the sufferings of Christ, uh, the cross, which and then eventually leads us to the resurrection on Easter Sunday. So, uh, but not only is it a time to reflect on what Christ has done, but it's really an also a good season for us to reflect inwardly uh, and to really uh, ask this question: Is Christ has sacrificed for me? What can I sacrifice for Him? And, uh, and so this is usually a time where, uh, usually 40 days, where we look inwardly and ask that question. And so uh, over these next few weeks, we're going to be looking at the passion of Christ through the lens of Mark, through Mark. Uh, there are four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Uh, they're all uh, written a little differently. Uh, you have Matthew, for example. He was a tax collector. He was one of the apostles uh, of Jesus, and so he writes Matthew. Uh, he writes his gospel from a Jewish perspective, uh, and he's basically talking to a Jewish audience, and he's he's basically trying to talk to them about how Jesus fulfilled uh, the messianic prophecies of the Old Testament that he truly was the Messiah. Okay, so you have Matthew's gospel. You also have John's gospel. John was an apostle as well, uh, but John's gospel is different because if you notice his gospel, uh, he's known as the apostle of love. And so you'll notice that God's love is the central theme of his gospel. It's very, it's very different from Matthew's, but they were both apostles. They were with Jesus for three and a half years, and I witnessed everything that happened. Now you also have Luke. Now Luke is a little different because Luke was not an apostle, okay? But he was a historian, and so what Luke did is Luke went around and he recorded and, and, and interviewed eyewitnesses uh, of, of those who were with Jesus. So Luke's gospel is this collection that, that he has of eyewitnesses, eyewitness accounts when Jesus walked the earth. So that's Luke. Now, Mark, uh, again, he also was not an apostle. He was not an apostle, but he's, but he's in the Bible. Uh, if you look at the uh, book of Acts, you'll find Mark. He's known as John Mark. Uh, he w went on the very first missionary journey with Paul and Barnabas, okay? Uh, he's also listed in 2 Timothy. Paul mentions him in 2 Timothy. His mom, uh, uh, basically her home was a central place in Jerusalem where uh, the apostles, the first church, would move in and out, okay? And so... Many people believe this. Many people believe that Mark uh, didn't interview uh, a lot of people, but he interviewed Peter. Okay, so what we have in Mark's gospel is a firsthand account of Peter. And so Peter is relaying the information of his three and a half years with Christ, and Mark records uh, what Peter saw, what Peter heard. Okay, so that's a little background there of the book of Mark. Mark's gospel is known as... Uh, the gospel of action, because if you notice Mark's gospel, Jesus is always on the move, and he's on the move towards the cross. In fact, 53% of Mark's gospel is centered around uh, the sufferings of Christ, okay? So 53, so a little over half of his gospel is about Jesus' sufferings. And so, so, so you kind of see that that's where Mark is pointing us to. He's pointing us to the cross of his suffering, but eventually his triumph. So, so that's a little bit about Mark. And so, uh, so today, as, as we kind of get into this this morning, uh, we're going to be looking at a passage of Scripture in the, pas in the Passion uh, of Mark chapter 14. And, and what we find through the Passion is it truly is remarkable, what Jesus did for us. And that's what I hope that we can, uh, as we study this over these next few weeks. But, but Mark chapter 14 this morning, uh, in Mark's gospel, 
uh, a lot of times he does what is called a Marquean sandwich. Now, I know that sounds kind of weird, but in a sandwich, you have this. You have two pieces of bread, and you have the meat in the middle, okay? Now, for me, I'm, I'm more of a meat guy. Anybody can relate, you know? So, like, I, you know, I, 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 bread is just the, you know, it's, it's just basically a filler, right? I don't even know why in the Big Mac. Why do they add the extra piece of a bun in there? I don't get that. But anyways, because I want the meat, right? I want the meat. In fact, I like meat so much that my wife teases me sometimes. I'll just go into the refrigerator and I'll just grab lunch meat and wrap it in cheese. And she says, that's gross. I'm like, that's what I want anyways. I really don't care about the bread. I just want the meat. I want the meat. And so you have, so, so a sandwich, you have two pieces of bread. You have the bookends that holds the sandwich together, but the main part of it is the middle, Whatever you want on that, turkey, ham, whatever, you know, uh, you know, salami, I don't care. It's the middle part, right? So Mark's gospel, oftentimes he, he writes in this way. So Mark's gospel is not necessarily in chronological order of the life of Jesus. When we think, when we think of uh, writing, when we read a book from beginning to end, you know, that, that's how we read, right? We read, okay, you know, this is the beginning, this is the end of the story, uh, Mark's, uh, uh, back in biblical times, that really wasn't their point, okay? So that's why if you ever read the Gospels, you know, so wait a minute, why, why is this story placed here and why is this story placed there? Because that really wasn't the point of the, of the writers, right? They're, they're, they're basically recounting the stories of Christ and, they, and they're placing them there for a reason, okay? Does that make sense? And so, so in Mark's Gospel, sometimes what he'll do is he'll... He'll create this sandwich where you have these uh, two bookend stories, but the main point, the main meat is the middle. Not that the other two stories are not important, but the, the main point that he's trying to make is in the middle. And so Mark chapter 14 is a great example of that. Uh, and, and what we find is, is three different uh, accounts of devotion, three different types of devotion, Okay, so I just was thinking about devotion. Uh, you know, in, in life, people are devoted to all sorts of things, right? People are devoted to all sorts of things. For example, some people are devoted to their job. You know, they get, they get there early. They work hard. They get all their projects done on time. They stay late. They're very good at their job. They talk about their job. They, uh, so they're devoted to their job, right? Some people are devoted to their family, which is good. That's a good thing, you know, and sometimes if you go to a cemetery, you'll notice on the, on the tombstone, what it will say, devoted mother, devoted father, right? Because they were devoted to their family. That's what they're remembered for. They're remembered for their devotion. Uh, some people are devoted to other things, like my daughter, I love her, she's devoted to health, right? And, and so, but it's not just a fad for her. I mean, she is seriously devoted to eating healthy, uh, exercise, these sorts of things. Uh, she gets on me all the time, you know, because I, I, like, I like pop. And, uh, and so every time that she sees me with a can of Pepsi, she tells me how bad it is for me, right? But it just hasn't changed me yet. But anyways, I still, I still like my Pepsi. But, but she's very devoted to that, right? Some people are devoted to all sorts of things. Here's the definition of devotion. I thought this was really good. Definition of devotion is this, uh, love loyalty or enthusiasm for a person, activity, or a cause. Okay, so that's what devotion is. It, it's love, loyalty, enthusiasm towards a person, an activity, or a cause, right? Some people are very devoted to sports or sports team, right? Right? Some people are devoted to other activities. I was... I. I I had to tease my son, Ethan, because I said, can I, can I tell the story on you? Because there was a time in his life he was very devoted to Fortnite. Does anybody know Fortnite? Some of you, some of you parents, right? So, like, Fortnite is this game, this video game where, you know, they have all these different characters, and they, they're dressed funny, and they do these funny dances and all this. And, and, uh, and so he was pretty obsessed with it. And so he was very enthusiastic, okay? That's devotion. He was very enthusiastic, we go to bed at 9 o'clock sometimes. We don't actually go to bed. We watch TV in our bedroom. And, uh, and so he's playing that game, and he'll come up at, he'd come up at 10 o'clock at night, and he'd talk our ear off about Fortnite. I don't care about Fortnites, but just, you know, but, but he's very enthusiastic, 
He was very devoted to it. So that's what devotion is. Enthusiasm, love, loyalty for a person, an activity, or a cause. So Mark chapter 14, we have three different types of of devotion. Okay, let's take a look at the first one. Mark chapter 14, starting verse 1 and 2. It says, Now it was now two days before the Passover, and the feast of unleavened bread, and the chief priests and the scribes were seeking how to arrest him by stealth and kill him, for they said, Not during the feast, let there be an uproar from the people. So we have two different groups of people here. We have the chief priest and the scribes. The chief priests were the Sanhedrin, okay? The Sanhedrin belonged to the high priestly family. They wielded great power, okay? So, so they were basically in charge of all the religious activity, the Sanhedrin. Now, the scribes were the Pharisees. The Pharisees were obsessed with the law and their traditions. In fact, they loved the law so much that they made laws upon laws, <laughs> So, so you have the law in the Old Testament in Leviticus, but then they would expand the law and make even more laws because that's how much they loved it. So we could say this. We could say, first of all, that, uh, that they were devoted to religion, which is true, but that's really not what Mark is trying to get at here. What Mark is trying to point out is what they were devoted to at this point in time is they were devoted to killing Jesus. They were devoted to killing Jesus. I, I just notice the language that Mark uses here. They were looking, they were looking, they're on the lookout for some sly way to arrest him. They were seeking an opportunity to seize him. I love that it uses the word stealth or even a sly way. That's an interesting word here. It means uh, to bait, to trap, to fish hook, uh, bait and switch. Right? How many you remember? You know, like car, I always think about. I hopefully nobody's car salesmen, but you know, I think about. You know, sometimes you think about. You know, they advertise a car in the paper, and it looks like a really good deal. And then you get to the car lot, and they're like, oh, we we just sold that car, but we have this one, and it's like you know, ten thousand dollars more. The old bait and switch, right? And and it's a technique, and so that's what this word means here. It means they're they're sly. They're being stealth about why were they being stealth about it why were they being sneaky because it was the passover and they didn't want to cause a riot jesus had gained a following at this point and if they would have arrested him during the time of passover they were afraid it would have caused an uproar so that's that's the first thing so the religious leaders they were devoted to killing jesus now let's take a look at the other piece of bread okay let's jump down to verse 10 because now we're introduced to Judas, okay? Then Judas Iscariot, who was one of the 12, went to the chief priest in order to betray him to them. And when they heard it, they were glad and promised to give him money, and he sought an opportunity to betray him. So here you have Judas. What is Judas devoted to? Right. Me, 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 right? He's devoted to self right? And so he, he is basically coming to the religious leaders that were devoted to killing Jesus, and he was their way, their, their avenue to killing him. And so the Bible says that he was willing to betray Jesus for a sum of money. The Bible says that, the, that money is the root of all evil. It's not that money is evil. Uh, money is neutral, right? It's neutral. It's not, uh, it's basically, it's not really good or bad, but it can be used for good purposes or bad purposes. Am I making sense? It's neutral. But what is bad is this, is when greed can consume our hearts. And that's what happened with Judas. Greed had consumed his heart. In fact, the, the Bible says that Judas was, was uh, the treasurer of the apostles, and John tells us that Judas would often take money from the treasury. He would take money for himself from the treasury. He was stealing from the offering plate, basically. And so he was consumed with greed. Now, now Mark doesn't say how much money, but we do know from the other gospels, it was 30 pieces of silver that he betrayed Jesus for, 30 pieces of silver. What's interesting to me about that is that 
I mean, it, it, it's, 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 you know, a little bit of money, but it really wasn't that much money. It was about five weeks worth of wages, five weeks. So a little over a month, Judas was willing to give it all up. He was willing to betray Jesus for five weeks worth of wages. And you just, you, want, you know, I was thinking about this. Why? Why was, why was Judas really willing to betray Jesus uh, for that amount or just willing to betray Jesus, period? And I think it comes down to this. I, I think it comes down to Judas had expectations coming in, and Jesus didn't meet those expectations. You know, because Judas, I believe, believed that, that Jesus was going to be this Messiah that many of the Jews believed that the Messiah would come and he would be a king and he would reestablish the nation of Israel and that he would have an army. He would overthrow Rome. And so Judas is thinking just like Israel, Israel had 12 tribes, 12 apostles. He's saying, man, I'm going to be part of one of the tribes. I'm going to have a territory I'm going to rule, and I'm going to reign alongside the Messiah. I'm going to be a person of, of importance. People are going to recognize me. People are going to see me. And, and, and all of a sudden, Jesus, if you, again, in Mark's gospel, 53% of it is dedicated to Jesus' sufferings. And he starts to talk about how, you know, we don't hate our enemy. We love our enemy. And he's going to, about, you know, he's going to suffer. He's going to die. And Judas is like, whoa, whoa, whoa. I didn't sign up for this. This, this isn't my expectations of what I thought was going to happen. And I think he began to have doubts in all of this. He says, man, now all of a sudden he's consumed with self. So, man, what can I get out of this? And he was willing to betray Jesus for 30 pieces of silver. And, and we know later that Judas felt guilty for that and ended up hanging himself later on uh, in the Gospels. But he was devoted to self. So you have these two Pieces of bread, these two bookends this morning. You have the religious leaders devoted to killing Jesus, and then you have Judas who's devoted to self. And then right in the middle, you have this meat, which is the exact opposite of these two because we're introduced to a woman. Now, Mark doesn't tell us her name, but, but I believe this was Mary because John's gospel says it was Mary. And what was Mary devoted to? Well, she was devoted to worshiping Jesus. She was devoted to worshiping Jesus. Let's jump up now. Let's jump at the middle. Let's jump up to the meat. Verse 3. And while he was at Bethany in the house of Simon the leper, he was reclining at a table, and a woman came with an alabaster flask of ointment, a pure nard, very costly, and she broke the flask and poured it over his head. I want you to get a picture here of what's happening. Jesus enters the house of a man by the name of Simon the leper. Now, at this point, we, we know he's not a leper anymore because they wouldn't have been gathered together in a home. We, we, you know, we, it's, it's so funny. I always think through COVID lens now because it's like, because now to, you know, nowadays, you know, uh, in, in those days, uh, lepers had to be quarantined. So, I mean, you think about quarantine. So, so if they couldn't, they couldn't, they couldn't have been gathered in a home because if Simon had leprosy. So that means Simon was healed. He was healed by Jesus, and he invites Jesus over into his home. But not only do you have Simon, John's gospel tells us that Lazarus was also there. So you've got a leper that was healed, and then you got a guy that Jesus raised from the dead. Talk about two guests in your home, right? Because Lazarus was dead for four days, and Jesus raised him. Then you also have the apostles... And then you have Mary and most likely Martha. And so the Bible says that Mary does something extraordinary here. That the Bible says that she takes this, this, uh, this glass of pure nard, alabaster perfume. She breaks the jar and she begins to pour it over Jesus' head. Now, in, in John's gospel, it also says that not only she poured over his head but it also went on down to his body and to his feet and that she washed Jesus' feet with her hair. And Bible times, women would not let their hair down. Uh, only basically prostitutes would do that because uh, women would only let their hair down in, uh, uh, only inside of a home with her husband. So you got to understand, this was a very intimate moment that, this, that Mary was doing. And as she was doing this, she was worshiping. The Bible says that it was very 
expensive pure perfume. Perfume is just expensive, period. Has any, any of you guys ever uh, went shopping for your wife and tried to buy your wife perfume? That's hard, isn't it? Uh, you know, you go into the department store, and first of all, that's just uncomfortable uh, because, you know, they, they, and they got, you know, those, those glass cabinets, and, and then they have all those workers that are around there, and then you're trying to buy their perfume, and so you're, you're in this conundrum because you're like, okay, I need to smell it, because I want, you know, I want something I'm going to like. You know, I want her to smell good. And it's like, but I don't want to spray it on me because I'm going to smell girly. And so, so, so they have those pieces of uh, uh, cardboard. So you spray it on the cardboard. And then you're walking around, you know, smelling all of it. And you just look weird. And, and uh, all these people are gathered around. Can I help you? Can I help you? But, but perfume is expensive. It's expensive, isn't it? It's like the first time I bought Jennifer some perfume for Christmas. I'm like, what? You want that much for that? You know, crazy, right? I, I did this research. The most expensive bottle of perfume right now is Clive Christian Number no. 1 Imperial Majesty. That's a mouthful. This perfume bottle is handcrafted. It is crystal. The neck is 24 karat gold. Anybody guess how much this cost? $1,000? More? 2000 Five? Six? No, not that much. $12,725. Do you know what? I don't know. I could look that up, though. Probably not a lot. I saw the bottle, so I would, I would guess maybe, I don't know, maybe four ounces. I don't know, but anyways, I don't know. $12,725. I knew somebody was going to ask me that. I should have looked. But the, crazy, right? So Mary, the Bible says that this was very valuable. In fact, we know that this was probably a, a family heirloom for her, right? Uh, we, we know this. It, it, uh, it, it was probably, it, in fact, it tells us that it was a year's wages, a year's wages for this perfume. So it was very costly. Uh, like I said, it was probably a family heirloom. But yet she takes this and she breaks it. And she puts it all over Jesus. And it's interesting the response of those in the room in verse 4 and 5. It says, there were some who said to themselves indignantly, why was this ointment wasted like this? For this ointment could have been sold for more than 300 denarii. So there's the, the value of this. 300 denarii and given to the poor. And they scolded her. Man, they scolded her. For doing that. So basically, what are they saying? They're saying it's waste. You just wasted this valuable perfume. At least, at the very least, you could have sold it and given it to the poor. My guess is that was Judas that said that. Because we know that was Judas's job. And I don't think Judas would have given it to the poor. Because we know that Judas' heart was full of greed. He was already taken from the treasury. My guess is Judas said, hey, I'll take that. I'll sell that to the poor and probably take it for himself or at least a portion of it. But they're saying that is wasteful. But here's what I want you to see sometimes. That sometimes what the world sees as wasteful, God sees as worship. What the world sees as wasteful, God often sees it. As worship, I have a friend, he's a pastor, and he went to school, and he got an engineering degree in aerospace. The dude is smart, okay? Got a job, was living out in Washington, and he felt a call into ministry, called a pastor. And he left his job, he left his good-paying job, everything, you know, uh, uh, you know, everything he'd worked for to go pastor a church. And guess what people said? What a waste. You wasted all those years. You're wasting your master's degree. You're wasting your education. You have a family. You, ha you have a wife. You have kids. You have a nice house. You're making, you know, six figures. I mean, high six figures money to, to pastor a church. That is wasteful. But what the world sees as wasteful, God often sees it 
as worship. I think of our missionaries that we support. You know, these are, these are men and women who have committed their lives to leave the comforts of America, to go to a land that they've never been, to tell people the gospel, people they've never met. And they're living, and some of them are living in jungles <laughs> to share the gospel. And what do people say? That's wasteful. That's wasteful. But God sees it as worship. And that's what Jesus, listen to Jesus' response in verse 6. <laughs> Jesus says, leave her alone. Why do you trouble her? And here's the key. She has done what? A what? Right. She has done a beautiful thing. I love that. She has done a beautiful thing to me. For you always have the poor with you, and whenever you want, you can do good for them, but you will not always have me. She has done what she could. She has anointed my body beforehand for burial, and truly I say to you, wherever the gospel is proclaimed in the whole world, what she has done will be told in memory of her. I love that. So, the, so those in the room were saying, waste, waste, waste waste. And Jesus says, it's beautiful. It's beautiful. She has done a beautiful thing. I love verse eight. It says she is, she did what she could. She did what she could. The passion translation says she did all that she could to honor me. I like that, that it adds that she did all she could to honor me. You know, sometimes coaches, they're trying to motivate a, a team right before they go and they play. And what do they say? They say, it's, give it your all. Give 100%. Lay it all on the line. But that's what that woman did. She laid it all on the line. She gave 100%. You think about it. When she broke that bottle of perfume, there was no going back. You know, have you ever broke something before, broken glass before? You can't super glue it back together if it's in a million pieces. Right? Have you ever spilled milk before? You can't sweep it back into the carton, right? It, it's a done deal. You break the glass, it's done. I, I, was, I, I, I was a funny story this week. My wife got me a, some of you probably said, why does he come up with all these stories? These are all true stories. I'm just not really that smart. But anyways, so my wife got me a, a, a driver. Uh, I'm not a good golfer, but I like to golf anyways. And so she got me a golf driver for Christmas. And so... Uh, I think it was Friday, or it was this week, and so I didn't do this for the sermon illustration, by the way, either, but so I'm just in there in my bedroom, and I'm just like, you know, I'm just going to practice, kind of just kind of keep my arms straight, you know, and so I, I've got my golf club, and I'm just going, you know, do-do-do-do-do, and as, and as I do it, I didn't realize how long the golf club was, and I, bam, I hit, I hit the, the, the glass, you know, the covering of the light, and shattered it in a million pieces, my wife comes running, what happened, and I'm just like, I'm like, <laughs> so it wasn't the kids. It was me. It was me. But there's no coming, there's no going back. It was shattered, right? And I think about that woman. When she shattered that jar of perfume, there was no going back. When that ointment was poured over Jesus' head, she couldn't, she couldn't collect that again to resell it. She was giving 100%. She was devoted. And sometimes when it comes to our relationship with God, it's like, I don't know if I want to give 100%. Maybe I'll just do the bare minimum. I don't, I don't want to be labeled a Jesus freak. I don't want to be labeled, uh, you know, that, you know, I, I'm okay if I'm labeled religious because it's okay in our culture to be religious, especially this time of year. This is the season of Lent, you know, and, and, uh, and I don't, I don't mean to go on a tangent, but, you know, it's like, uh, you know, hey, I'm okay with going to McDonald's and getting my fish filet on Friday. Look at me. You know, I'm doing my, I'm doing my good deed. You know, I, I'm, doing my, I'm doing my thing here, eat my fish. But yet, and I'm not saying that there's nothing wrong with that, but what I'm saying is, is God doesn't want our religion. What he wants is our worship. He wants our worship. He wants our devotion. And, and do you think... Everybody in the room thought what Mary was doing was a little extreme. But Jesus said it was beautiful. There was no going back. It is said of Julius Caesar that as they were going to conquer England, um, there was a great, dif uh, uh, a great distance between the two, and they came in by ships. 
And the Celts were known to have a massive, massive army. And in fact, uh, Caesar's army was outnumbered three to one. And so Caesar made a very, very bold move. So as they came to the, the port and they got out of the ships, Caesar ordered for the ships to be burned. Because he knew that if the Celts began to push them back, they would be tempted to get back into the ships and retreat. And so he wanted them to be 100% committed to the cause. And I think about that this morning because I think that's what Mary was doing. She was 100% committed when she broke that jar of perfume. There was no going back. That jar was broken and spilled out. And, 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 and Jesus says this, uh, that she was anointing my body for burial. I love that. You know, there's some foreshadowing that happens here. Because Jesus is foreshadowing his own death. Because what happened with Jesus? You see, that perfume bottle was broken and spilled out. But the Bible says that Jesus' body was broken and spilled out. Jesus' body was broken on the cross and his blood was spilled out so that our sins can be forgiven. I'm glad Jesus didn't give 50%. I'm glad Jesus didn't give 75%. I'm glad Jesus didn't even give 90%. I'm glad glad Jesus gave 100% because his body was broken and spilled out for me. Philippians chapter 2, 7 and 8, it says, Christ, he emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. Jesus emptied himself for me. And God asked of us, will you empty yourself? So what are we holding back this morning? Sometimes we hold back our worship. We hold back our worship. Sometimes we hold back our time. Oh, God, I'll make time for you if, if you know, I'll make room in my calendar if, if, I, if I have the time. Sometimes we hold back our honesty with God. Sometimes we hold back. Sometimes we hold back certain relationships that we want to keep that we know that are maybe not healthy relationships, but we keep them anyways, and yet God's saying, maybe you need to give that relationship to me. Sometimes we hold back our gratitude to God. What are we holding back? Mark Batterson says this. I love this. He says, if, if Jesus is not Lord of all, then he is not Lord at all. If he is not Lord of all, then he is not Lord at all. I think sometimes we are good at making Jesus our Savior to forgive us of our sins. But how good are we at making Jesus our Lord? And that's a totally different thing, friends. It's a, it's a totally different thing. When we ask Jesus to be our Savior, we, we're asking Jesus to cover us and forgive us of our sins. But Jesus not only wants to be our Savior, he wants to be our Lord. And that means he wants to be master and ruler over our lives, 100% of our lives. And so what do we need to give to God? I close with this story this morning. This is a true story. It's about a, a pastor that was uh, visiting a church, and he was raising money for uh, Bibles in China. And so after the service, they took up an offering, and there was this little girl that came forward with a jar of change. And she said, I want to give this jar of change to buying Bibles. And she said, I've been, this money, I've been saving this money to buy my mommy a house. But I feel that God wants me to give this money for Bibles. Now, the pastor actually knew the story. He knew that the grandfather was bringing this little girl to church. In fact, the grandfather had custody of the little girl because his, uh, this little girl's mom was in prison. She was facing 23 felony counts and she was about to appear before a judge. She was facing about up to three years in prison for, a, for, for meth. And so she said, in her mind, she, in fact, inside that mason jar was $12.75. And in this little girl's mind, she thought that was enough money to buy her mommy a house. She didn't know. All she knew that is that she had a broken home and she was trying to fix it. 
But yet, at the same time, she felt God was asking her to give all that she had, all that she had saved, and to give it to Bibles. And she took the risk, and she gave it. And the pastor at first was reluctant, but he felt like that's if she wanted to do that as her sacrifice. And so he took it, and he began to share the stories, he began to travel and raise money for Bibles, and he would share it at churches all over the United States. And he would share the story about the little girl who gave her all, $12.75. And as he began to share that story, people began to give sacrificially, and he was able to raise over $2 million for Bibles in China. By the way, China is a communist nation. It's illegal to have Bibles, so they would smuggle the Bibles in China so people could have the word. But here's the, the, the story is that when the mother faced the judge, the judge said this. She says, you do not deserve mercy. He says, in fact, I've talked to your parole officer, and he has said you are the worst case he has ever seen. You've lost absolutely everything. You've lost your home. You've lost your husband. You've lost your dignity, and you've lost your only child. And he says, I don't know why I'm doing this, but I feel that I need to give you a second chance. And instead of sending you to prison for three years, I'm gonna send you to a halfway home so that you can get help. 10 years later, this woman today is a worship leader in her church. and She's got custody of her little girl and she's serving Jesus. But I just think about this this morning. I think about that one little girl's act of sacrifice. In her mind, $12.75 was everything. It was all that she had. <laughs> and when she felt the call of God, she was willing to give it her all. In her mind, it was enough money to buy a house. But she was willing to give it. And so today, I just wonder about our devotion. I think sometimes we look at this story of Mary, and it's a great story, but I think honestly, sometimes as I look in the mirror, this is Todd speaking, when I look in the mirror, sometimes I look more like Judas than I do Mary. And when I say that, I'm saying that sometimes I'm more consumed with myself than I am my devotion to God. And so I just pray today that even for myself and for all of us this morning, that today that we would reflect as we're in this season, because this is what Lent is. It, it's, a, it's a season of reflection. It's a, not a season of condemnation or feeling guilty. It, it's just a season for us to reflect inwardly in our own relationship with God and say, God, how can I grow closer to you during this season? It's not a religious thing. It's a thing about inwardly seeking God and saying, God, how do you want me to work? And so today, as we reflect inwardly today, that's what I pray. God, let's, let's reflect on our devotion to him. There's an old song that I grew up with. Maybe some of you know this song. I don't know if you do or not. But there was an old song we used to sing in church, and it was called, I Surrender. And here's just the, the, the line. It goes this, like this. All to Jesus, I surrender. All to him, I freely give that I will ever love and trust him and in his presence I will daily live. All to Jesus I surrender, humbly at his feet I bow. Worldly pleasures all forsaken. Take me Jesus, take me now. And then the chorus goes, I surrender all, I surrender all. All to Jesus I surrender, I surrender all. So if that's you today and you say, God, if that's the prayer of my heart today. God, we just want to surrender all to you. I just pray today that we would look inwardly in our devotion and say, God, we want to just surrender it all to you. Let's just pray this morning.